Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today for a session on how we created a learning culture here at per Perimetrix. And when I say a learning culture, I mean instilling a healthy culture of debriefs and positive discussions that ultimately minimize issues and backfires internally. I'm excited to share with you our journey here at Conf32. My name is Amir Shaked. I lead the research and engineering team here at Perimeterix, and I'm an experienced breaker of uh, production environments. We are a software as a service company, providing solutions to protect uh, modern web apps at scale. Behind the scenes, we have a cloud-based microservices environment on a large scale, uh, around uh, 15,000 cores, 300 microservices. Uh, and like any other production environment, we too see failures all the time. Today, we're going to cover our journey through the process of change towards creating a healthy and supportive learning culture by taking those failures and building on those. This is the essence of chaos engineering. And while a lot can be said on the technical aspects of randomly breaking things to find gaps, reality can always surprise you. Every production environment I worked on experienced issues, sometimes due to code changes, other times due to third party providers having their entire infra crashing, leading us to seek ways to learn and improve constantly on how we do things, how we protect the system, and at the end of it, how do we provide the best service to our customers. When I joined the company, I set a destination of wishing to see rapid deployments, uh, being able to provide the most adequate and up-to-date solution. In our case, um, in a world of moving target defense where the scope of features changes all the time due to threat actors, being able to deploy changes quickly is a major factor in our ability to provide a competitive product. In fact, oftentimes a good DevOps culture can be the differentiator and act as a competitive edge for your company. Now, we wanted to have zero downtime and have errors or mistakes happen only once, so we'll have a chance to learn, but not twice, meaning we didn't uh, learn the first time. However, the starting point wasn't that right. We saw a few repeating issues. Minor things causing failures in production due to code changes or configuration changes, um, being uh, too prone to incidents in the underlying cloud environment uh, we were using, affecting our stability. Those two factors were very concerning. When we looked at how we are going to grow and scale, looking at 10x and 100x ahead, but maybe a minor risk today will likely be catastrophic in the future. <clears throat> and that future can be next week in an, if you're in a fast growing company. While those were concerning, the last one really prevented us from improving, and that's the fear of judgment. Whenever we dove into trying to understand issues we had, there were pushbacks. Why do we ask so many questions? Do we not trust our people? Why don't we just let them uh, just do their job? They know what they're doing. And that's a problem. If you have team members afraid or feeling they're being judged or generally insecure in their work environment, they're going to underperform and as a team. Uh, you will not be able to learn and adapt. In essence, this is the whole point of this exercise. So with that starting point and the destination in mind, we set off to establish a new process uh, within the team of how we analyze every kind of failure, uh, what do we do during the analysis, how to conduct a debrief and the follow-up. Why do we focus on the process? Because a bad system will beat a good person every time. And assuming you have the right foundation of engineers, if you fix the process, uh, good things will happen. So let's start with an example, which I'm sure any of us who owns production environments experienced either the same or similar and, or can relate in some way. Um, and I'll start with uh, a use case and how it relates to the process. So you have an incident, uh, a customer is complaining about something misbehaving in their environment and they think it might be related to you and they're calling support. Support is trying to analyze and understand and after a while, um, realizing, realizing they don't know what to do with it, they will page the engineering team as they should. The engineering team wakes up because it's the middle of the night um, and they're in another time zone. They work to analyze what's going on. They find the problem, they fix it. They might resent the fact that they had to fix it in the middle of the night, obviously. And they go back to sleep and move on to other tasks the next day. If that's the end of it, you are certain to experience similar issues again from similar root causes. So you should ask yourself, why is it happening? What can we do better? What can we do to avoid seeing this issue in any potential similar case in the future? You have to set time to analyze after the fact. This is the only way to make sure root causes are found and, and process problems are improved. Lessons are taken and can be learned from. 
a case in hand we, we actually had. A code was deployed into production by mistake. How can it happen? Well, we had an engineer merging the code into the main branch. Um, the code failed uh, for some of the tests, but it was late at night, and uh, they decided to leave as it, uh, as it is and keep working tomorrow, knowing that code will not be deployed from uh, main to production. What he didn't know was there was a process added by the a DevOps engineer earlier that week that automatically deployed that specific uh, code to production when, were, when there was a, a need to auto-scale that specific microservice. And that night, we had a specific um, usage increase spinning up more services with the buggy code. Uh, now, here lies the issue. We can focus a lot on why the buggy code was merged into main, why the auto scale was added. If you focus too much on why certain someone uh, did something or didn't do, um, don't they understand uh, what they're going to, we're going to miss the entire issue of, wait a minute, the process is flawed. How could you? And then an engineer actually merge code into production, not, not understanding that it's going to be deployed. There is a meaning behind specific repositories or specific ways you manage the code, branches, naming conventions, and all of that. It's in our case. So if you fix the process, the problem aligns in this specific case, aligning all engineers to understand that the main branch equal deployment to production, no matter which service that is. The way to approaching merging branches to, to the main branch will change drastically. Now, fixing this with the process and uh, not over judging what a specific employee did or didn't do when they were just trying to do their job will prevent this from happening again. So how do we learn from such an incident? Well, there are four steps to the process. It starts with the incident, obviously. Um, and, and the more mature you become as an organization and learning culture, the team will create an incident from supposedly minor things just for the follow-up and learning from them, which is a really healthy stage to be at. You provide an immediate resolution to the issue. And then 24 to 72 hours afterwards, really depending on how much time they had to sleep um, and work hours, you're going to do a debrief. And we're going to talk a bit more about that meeting and how to conduct it in, in the next slide. Two weeks after the meeting, we do a checkpoint to review the action items that came from the debrief and make sure things are incorporated, especially the immediate tasks. So let's talk about conducting a debrief. Now, this isn't a standard retrospect, as it's usually following an incident that may have been even a very severe in impact. When do you debrief? Every time you think the process and or the system did not perform well enough. I ask a lot of questions. The questions I ask are, first of all, what happened? Let's have a detailed timeline of events from the moment it really started. Not the moment somebody complained, not when the customer or somebody else raised the alarm, but from the moment the issue really started to roll into production, when the code was merged, when we changed the query, when the third-party provider we were using started to crash and updated the, their own status page. What's the impact? Also, a very important factor in creating a learning environment it helps to convey a message to your entire engineering team by understanding what is the actual impact, be it cost-wise, customers affected, complaints. Get a full scope as you can. That is vital to help everyone understand why we're delving into the problem and why it is so important. It's not just that they wake up in the middle of the night being paged and it's bothering them. Uh, you have to understand the full picture of where everything is related and connected. Now. After you have the story and the facts, you start to analyze and brainstorm how to handle this better in the future. First two questions um, I use as a leading uh, into the discussion. Have we identified the issue in under a certain amount of time? Let's say five minutes. Why five minutes? Well, it's not arbitrary. Uh, we want to have a specific goal on how fast we do things. So did we identify the issue in under five minutes? Sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't. Did we fix the problem in under an hour? Completely fixed. Did we do it under 10 minutes? Do we need to do anything at all? Was it completely resolved automatically and there was no point of us trying to analyze anything? Once we have the answer, uh, once you answer no to any of these, the follow-up should be, okay, we understand the full picture. What do we need to do? What do we need to change? What do we need to develop? So we will be able to answer yes to, to, to the following two questions. This part was seemingly simple. Um, led to a drastic culture change over time. Setting the framework in that way helps convey to everyone the focus is on the process and the system. And it's not about anyone specific. Whoever caused the incident today is irrelevant. Tomorrow it can be a different uh, employee entirely. Now, any culture change takes time. 
Uh, we had um, some things we had to resolve along the way, um, and I already mentioned a few of those solutions uh, on how we did it. First of all was lack of trust, especially if you have a new manager coming in, trying to instill a new process, trying to change the culture. It takes time. Uh, lack of trust could be in the process, could be in questions. People could ask themselves, is there a need, an agenda perhaps behind it? How would it not become the blame game we had before? Uh, this can be completely resolved if you do it properly and consistently. What often happens uh, when you're trying to understand why a problem occurred, people might say he or she did something at fault and the real issue is, is something else. Also important to notice, um, not following up on action items. Something that's really annoying. You, we, you do the process, you review everything, you set, you set action items, uh, and then you have the same problem all over again a few weeks or a few months later. How did it happen? So you see that the action items that were set weren't being followed up on. The resolution we had was very simple. We established the checkpoints. Uh, you have the debrief. You set checkpoints every two, three weeks, whatever time frame is relevant for you to make sure that the immediate action items are handled. Um, personally, what I also do is I label each JIRA ticket with a debrief and do a monthly review of all the debrief items to see what is left open, be it irrelevant or something that had to be moved uh, upwards. And another critical move we've made to resolve future issues is implementing a proper communication on wide scale. Make sure everybody knows there was a debrief, uh, where we're publishing our debriefs very widely within the company, exposed to all, all the employees, uh, with the details of what happened, what we're going to do to make it better. This helps bridge the gap of trust, if you might have it, and show that everything is very transparent and visible. We saw that um, if you're not asking the right questions, to then the focus might be the problem and giving a wide audience can help uh, give another view uh, with more audience to um, identify gaps that might have been missed uh, within the bigger picture. Now, there are four main things I would want you to take from this session on how to conduct a debrief um, listed here. The first would be avoid blame. Avoid it altogether. And if you see blame starting to happen within a meeting, within a debrief meeting, you need to interfere and stop it politely. Always be calm, but you need to stop it to make sure it's on track and the media goes the way you want it to go. Because if there is a vision of um, how it's going to happen later on when you're instilling the change, it will happen on its own without needing to be involved in the process. Go easy on the why questions. It's important to understand why somebody did something uh, but the more you dive into it, if you ask somebody why they did see something, it could create uh, resentment or self-doubt for employees. Um, it can sound to them like you're being critical and judging on how they behave and why they're doing certain things. Be consistent, like I said before, um, and keeping calm. It's always important, especially when you're looking into things that failed, uh, to stay calm and show there is a path forward, especially helping uh, to creating a better change environment. Now, some of our most notable learnings from all of these processes uh, I've listed here, and I'll touch briefly on a few of those. Also, you can see uh, in the, the format of the debrief meeting here in the QR code you can follow up on. So, um, first of all, humans make mistakes. You need, we need to fix the process, not trying to fix people. The, that will not work because they work hard, they're smart, but everybody makes mistakes. Another thing I've often heard was gradual, gradual rollout. Now, it often appears to be some holy grail, perhaps, of microservices and large-scale production systems. It's a great tool, but it's not a silver bullet, and it will not resolve everything. And saying it will will miss a lot of problems that you need to uh, resolve in a different process of tools. Establishing crisis mode process, also a very important one. Feature flagging, especially if I'm connecting it to the second point, uh, in terms of handling errors quickly, it was really important for us. It was one of the things that we were able to do to disable certain features instead of rolling back a lot of um, services, sometimes thousands of dockers. And that helps reverting the code much faster and understanding if that's the cause of the problem or not. Maybe something else in the infrastructure is the issue and not even the code. We always try to avoid replacing something that we need to change in the system 
that we have um, at, uh, in place changes. When, we have, uh, when you have a lot of uh, loosely coupled uh, microservices, there is a lot of communication with one another and um, changing um, something in place can cause a lot of harm. So we try to split it into adding a new behavior uh, verifying it behaves as we expected, and then subtracting the old behavior and essentially splitting the process into two. Now, always um, trying to look 10x ahead on, on breaking points of the system, wherever things happen and can break. And, and treating config as code was also uh, a very crucial element in how we, how we do things. So that's it. Um, thank you for listening. I hope I gave you something new to use. Um, feel free to ping me on any of these mediums and ask questions, and I'd love to discuss with you more.